what's on that bracelet, it includes emergency contact, it includes where they live, phone numbers. That's because a lot of these folks often wander out and they get lost. 
they have damage to their hippocampus, and they can't find their way home. So I find that to be really fascinating because it means without your hippocampus, you can't form new memories, and your spatial memory is impaired. So why is that? Before we can help individuals like patient HM or patients with Alzheimer's, dementia, or hippocampal damage, we need to learn how the normal hippocampus functions. If we don't know how the normal fundamental building blocks work, we can't help these patients. Which brings me over to this figure here. This is one of the hippocampus in red. It's about the size of your thumb. If we're to measure it out, it's in your medial temporal lobe. And the hippocampus is a pretty long structure where there's this anterior head portion and posterior uh, tail portion. This is in human beings. If you were to look at the same image in rats, it's reversed a bit, but it's still homologous. It's pretty similar. What I mean by that is the red is the hippocampus in the rat brain. And this portion here, the anterior portion in humans, is homologous to the ventral part, or this down here in rats. And the top portion, the dorsal portion, is homologous to the tail portion or posterior portion of humans. Because of this homology, we can use rats as a model system to be able to study how normal physiology and I also want to say, uh, throughout this entire talk, if you have any questions at all, I'm more than happy to answer them as I go. I was wondering what is the blue portion? Yeah, the blue portion is called the entorhinal cortex, and that's what the hippocampus sends signals to. So it's a brain circuit. The hippocampus sends signals to the entorhinal cortex. Now this brings up the question, we have a dorsal region and we have a ventral region. To what degree do the dorsal and ventral regions act similarly or do they act differently? And that's really important to know because the hippocampus is not a homogeneous structure. We can't just say hippocampus, although we learn it in intro site, intro bio, that it's the memory center, but in reality, there are many different subdivisions within the hippocampus. And the further we break this down into subdivisions and cell types within here, the better we can later on target using drugs or therapy to better target potential areas that might be critical for different types of memory. So some of the functions of the dorsal hippocampus include a really fun study, you might have learned this in psych class, of taxi drivers. These are London taxi drivers, drive around London, this is a really hard road to be able to drive and navigate. And it was shown that these taxi drivers that drive around a lot, needing to spatially navigate, have increases in gray matter in their posterior region. And further, individuals who are blind, meaning maybe they're not spatially navigating as much, have smaller posterior regions. So this suggests that our brain, our hippocampus, is really plastic, that it's changing and it's valuable depending on what you do. Yeah? What is, what is gray matter? Yeah, gray matter is, uh, think of cell bodies. So neuronal cell bodies where there's a huge uh, density in them. Yeah. And when gray matter is like, it can target different portions of the brain, like so this example is the taxi drivers, the gray matter is targeting them spatial memory and their ability to drive, but like with certain other types of memory, it will target those instead, right? It's kind of like a blank slate and based on what you exercise in your everyday life, it will increase its focus on that. Yeah, I'm really glad that you brought that up because there's often this myth in poems. Uh, I know my parents said, Knock your head, you lose a brain cell, that's it, you're done, you have no more. Once you lose them, they're gone. That's a myth. <laughs> there are parts of your brain that uh, produce new neurons, called neurogenesis, and your hippocampus is one of them, which is a really fascinating topic. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So the anterior hippocampus feeds connections over to other areas or senses, potentially, that they might be using to compensate for. Great question. Now, these are human beings. How do you test this in rats and animals? What you do is you put them into a huge tub of water. Think about a small kitty swimming pool. And then you put them into the water and have them swim around to find a hidden platform. You can place them in multiple areas, and the more you do this, the more they'll figure out where that platform is. So in normal animals, this is a top-down view. So they're, they're swimming around, that's the path that you see, and this little black circle is where the platform is. In normal animals with their normal hippocampus, they'll swim to the platform. If you lesion the dorsal hippocampus, they swim all over the place, meaning they're lost. And if you lesion the ventral hippocampus, the study suggests that they can still find this, the platform. So, so what does this mean? It means that maybe your dorsal hippocampus is more critical for spatial memory than your ventral hippocampus, is what this suggests. But this is just one study. Let's go into some other studies that ask, what does the ventral hippocampus do? So dorsal hippocampus, spatial memory. Ventral hippocampus, if you lesion this area, it affects the animal's defensive behaviors, it affects their odor information, and it affects how anxious they are. What I mean by this is if you were to place an animal onto a plus maze, you might have learned this in your intro site plus, it's a maze that has four arms on it, and two of these arms are open. Two of these arms are closed. What that means is, imagine you're on the roof of this building and you're looking over the roof. You might feel really anxious, right? That would be these two arms are open. Whereas if there are walls, like there's a wall over there, I'm not gonna feel anxious if I look over. Animals tend to prefer to hang out in places that have walls versus places that have a ledge. If you lesion the dorsal of the campus, they do the same, they prefer safety. But if you lesion the ventral hippocampus, they're not anxious anymore. So this suggests that your ventral hippocampus is more critical for fear, anxiety-related type of processing. There are also some other studies to uh, support that idea. It's the same. If you record from neurons in the ventral hippocampus, the neurons fire increase their firing rate a lot when the animals are in this really scary place versus these two places that are more safe. So to put all this together, dorsal, spatial memory, ventral, anxiety fear related memories. And that maybe if you want to support somebody who has a spatial memory impairment, you target dorsal of the campus. If you want to support somebody with a fear related memory impairment, target ventral. So that's the basis of this idea, but not everyone believes it because I'm gonna show some data to suggest that it's not that simple. The next portion is after describing what the hippocampus is, I'm gonna show you a study I did a couple years ago where I taught the animals not only where they should be going in spatial navigation, but also when. So in episodic memory, it's who, what, where, when of these memories that you're processing. And of course, without this ability, we wouldn't be able to survive. Like we need to know where to go or when to go. Using this water maze task that I developed in my dissertation, we were able to train rats not only to swim to certain places, but to swim to those places in specific time points. This is what it looks like. It's a circular maze here, and it has these arms where the animal can either swim into or swim out of. And at the end of the arm, there's a hidden little platform. 
depicted by this white circle where you can start an animal and place them inside here and what they have to do is they have to swim to the hidden platform if they swim to g2 over here there's no platform they're not going to get out if they swim to g3 they're not going to get out if they swim to g1 that's where the platform is that's where they can escape this took a lot of training it, it took about a hundred days you can imagine the undergrads in the lab were <coughs> working every single day for almost a hundred days to teach an animal or a group of animals how to do this. Is it the same group of rats or did you switch them out? Yeah, the same group of rats. Did these guys suddenly like drown? Uh no, none of them drowned. The animals swim over there. Yes. Oh, what's the purpose of the four additional blackout arms on the face? Yeah, the four of the, these blackout ones. So the blackout ones are so that we can place the animal in different positions. So that they're not starting from the same location every time. So we place them in, you wait 30 minutes, you place them in again, and you expect them to swim to G2. You wait 30 minutes, and then you place them a third time, and you expect them to swim to G3. Yeah. So the idea is by the third time, you would expect them to go directly to G3. Yes, that's right. This is called sequence learning. If you're learning a phone number, let's say, one, two, three, four, you want to learn them in sequence. But it's not only which ones, it's also in the particular order that you're supposed to do them. Yes, please. Yeah, I really like this experiment because I'm just wondering what the reason is for like this starting to like help us between like combining the barn maze or like more barn maze. Yeah, this is a barn's maze, as Prince said. That's because in an open water maze, they're, they can swim anywhere, but if you give them a limitation, then you can see which they choose to swim to. So I taught animals, I taught animals successfully, or I should say my undergrads and I taught animals successfully to swim to G1, take a break, swim to G2, take a break, swim to G3. So anim all animals can do this. I then took the animals, and, and this is just the data just to show you that uh, in the first session, they can swim to G1. Almost 100% of them do. On the second session, almost 100% swim to G2, and the third, etc. So they're performing really well on this test. Yeah. How long do they have to swim to each area? It's a 30 second time. Yeah, there's a 60 second timeout, but they swim pretty quickly. It takes them five seconds maybe to swim to their location. And do the leading rats start? in the same place every time? No. Uh, these black denotations mean they can start from different locations. So they don't know where they're going to start from. They need to use the cues around the room to figure that out. Okay. How many trials are you doing per day to teach them the difference between um, session one two? I think at that time it was probably eight trials or so. Going through the whole sequence of, of the sessions. Yeah, if you're interested in this, uh, I have a paper on it that details the whole thing. That's right, or and then, yeah. I just wanted to ask, like, what is brain mapping useful in your research and if so how? Yeah, so I, I would be really fascinated to see what brain mapping circuits are critical for this. What I'm about to show you next is I teach animals this, and then I turn off their hippocampus and see how they do. It's asking the question, what would you expect if you have no hippocampus, how would you perform? So I implanted surgically. These are what are called cannula. Think of them as little tubes that go into different parts of the brain. The medial prefrontal cortex, really important for decision making, the dorsal hippocampus, and the intermediate hippocampus. And uh, these are coronal sections of the brain it's just a little map to show you each dot where these implants were placed in the brain. And then I injected a drug that will allow me to temporarily 
inactivate either the medial prefrontal cortex dorsal or intermediate cortex. Yes. When we do we're we're doing this selection approach, how did how did you know like when that specifically avoid I mean like targeting certain areas without, you know, having too large of an effect for the purposes? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you're interested in this type of work, I recommend you talk to Dr. Markham about it because he uses the same drug. It's called Usable. It's a GABA A agonist. And it's going to, um, locally, it doesn't diffuse very far, locally silence those neurons in that area. And Usable wears off, meaning after X number of hours, that gray area will come back. Do you, do this, do you do this while they're asleep or when they're like fully conscious? While they're awake. So moving further, I'm going to show you that after surgery, they still perform this task pretty well, almost 100%. But you'll notice on session two, they're not performing near 100% anymore after surgery. That must mean that the surgery itself is potentially affecting how these animals are behaving. And when they make an error, they usually choose G3, meaning that they're choosing the future goal location rather than the goal location they were just at. We'll keep this in mind because this is post-surgery for normal animals. These are animals that have already learned. I'm then going to inject plugs into different brain areas to see, that, see how that will change their behavior. This is the same figure, yeah. How did you how did you know that maybe one of the pain or maybe side effects from the surgery that caused the different results? Yeah, it, it could be that the animals are feeling some pain. We do give them painkillers and let them recover. After a while, it's just normal life for them. What could be happening is maybe we're damaging some tissue, right tissue as we're going down into the brain. For, for the sake of this experiment, we're just going to call this part over here our baseline that we're going to compare the drug conditions to. So in the baseline condition, these animals are preferring to look prospectively into the future to go into G3. And if I inject drugs into the hippocampus, if I inject a control drug, which is just brain uh, fluids, the animals still prefer to go to G3. If I inject mucimol, which is silencing the medial prefrontal cortex, what you'll notice is that the animals reset their sequence. Now let me say that in, in other words. If you don't have your medial prefrontal cortex, it will be very difficult for you to make decisions about what the sequential order of events would be. If you don't have your medial prefrontal cortex, it'll be very difficult for you to figure out rules and decision making. So by them not having that like, decision making, they just consistently are gonna start from the beginning. Step one. Yeah, 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 that's perfect. Um, you should, are you doing research or are you? Not yet. You should, you should be doing research. And, uh, and when we inject it into the hippocampus, either dorsal hippocampus or intermediate, or both dorsal and intermediate, they were just impaired, they were lost, they swam randomly. In summary, while normal animals made prospective errors, meaning that they chose future locations, if you turn off their medial prefrontal cortex, that's towards the front of your brain, they exhibited more retrospective areas. Uh, just like what you said, they restarted. And if you inactivate their hippocampus, they're at chance level. They swim around everywhere. So these data suggest that both dorsal and intermediate hippocampus are involved to a similar degree. And what exactly are they communicating in their brain? And that brings me over here to where am I? We talked about what the hippocampus is. Talk about when in time and sequence your hippocampus is critical and important. I'm going to dive into the where aspect of hippocampal processing. 
If you were to take electrodes, something I do in the lab, and build a device that looks like this here, this is what's called a hyperdrive. And in the lab, we have these electronic equipment where we can implant and lower electrodes. You can see it's really faint in line, but you can lower an electrode into the brain and record the activity of single neurons. In this case, I'm recording the activity of single hippocampal neurons. Yes, does this cause them pain? That's a great question again. So of course, surgery will be painful. You have no pain receptors in the brain. And throughout surgery, we do give them anesthesia. We give them painkillers to make sure that they recover properly. Uh, we also work together with vets as well, so that everything we do is under guidance and ethical consideration. I mentioned specific neurons, but the unstructured of other neurons, how they interact with one another. Yeah, when I record, I'm recording not just one neuron, I'm recording many of the cancer neurons simultaneously. What people have done in the past is that they recorded dorsal hippocampus. Dorsal, if you remember from your anatomy class, is closer towards the surface, whereas ventral is deeper in the brain. And if you were to guess, which one's harder to target? Ventral. Intermediate ventral. Dorsal is easy to target. That's why most people prior work targeted dorsal. I targeted both intermediate and ventral using this technology. And this is what it looks like in our rats. Again, after a while, they get used to it and uh, they receive food rewards in order to be patient. Is it like heavy on their head? Like, how can you do this? I'll show you how they walk. Okay, so, yeah. It looks like this here. And this is our uh, arena. They're running on this linear track over here. So, what they're doing is they're eating a sugar pellet running here, eating a sugar pellet. If any of you have been in the learning and memory lab space, you might notice these things here. These are food hopper dispensers that dispense out sugar pellets. So he's eating sugar pellets, going back and forth, and we're recording simultaneously the neurons in the hippocampus. Again, this is a top-down view. You'll see him over here running up, eating a sugar pellet, Running down, eating a sugar pellet, and he does this many, many times. As I'm recording this, remember I'm recording brain activity. So that's what you see over here. These four traces are changes in voltage across time. In humans, you might uh, be familiar with EEG type work. This is just done in animals. Yeah. What's the purpose of the lighting conditions? Like, why is it? Yeah, so these are albino rats, and they're very sensitive to light. They'll behave much better for you if you lower the lighting conditions for them. Yes? Is there, is there a particular reason albino rats are immune to the shape? Yeah, so rats are, when doing research, you want to find the model system that is the least in terms of higher order, but you can still conduct and realize the information that you're trying to get. Which is why a lot of pharmaceutical companies and drug companies will start with rats and mice, and then the passes then move on to non-human primates or humans eventually. Uh, but again, as I mentioned earlier, their hippocampus processes things very similar to our hippocampus. Uh, I think both can work. In this condition, I use uh, both ones. This is a video here. And what you're going to hear on the speaker system are popping sounds. Each pop is a neuron firing with action potential, which you've learned in class.
on the side over here, these are waveforms. And you might have seen these things pop up. And this is exactly what we see in your textbooks when these neurons depolarize and produce passion. Now, these are electrical signals that are communicating information. Um, so, after the action is actually fired, it be like, it has to be like, because I noticed when it goes up, it goes below digit uh -huh. and then it normalizes. Yeah. So, can you kind of explain that process a little bit? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, this cell is excited, and then it hyperpolarizes and it goes back down because it needs to regain, uh, it needs a little bit of time for the neuron to, to regain equilibrium. So it's like resting, kind of. Yeah, you could think of it as that too. And what you're listening to are not just activity from one neuron, but a group of neurons all together. Can you explain the occasional like big group of like polarization and then like subsequent like a big group of like hyperpolarization? Like I yeah. know there's there's like Yeah, yeah. So like, some like some places have more activity than others. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, let me show you this. This is the same video, but now I'm gonna color code things by two neurons. Pink neuron and a blue neuron. Okay. And you're going to see a dot appear. Each time a dot appears, that means an action potential spiked. Take a look at this. What do you notice? When you, when you recognize the, 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 the sugar carry, that's when the blue spike gives it, it gives it this and gives it this. Yeah. So it's, somebody said place, right? It's in the same place. That's what these neurons are called. Place cells. These are place cells. And interestingly, in patients with Alzheimer's dementia, sometimes their hippocampal cells can die off. That's your place cells dying, which is why you get lost and you can't find your way back home. It's perfect. Yeah, Neuralynx is a company that I use to uh, use the software to record that video. Okay, and could, could that same software be used to record like three other areas of that? Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't have to be hippocampus. And you'll notice if I were to plot this in a heat map type, okay, this is exactly what you just saw. It's just for this neuron B, high activity in this area, lower activity in other areas. That's a place cell. And this is a place cell representation. If you take these animals, and again, there's a place field, you could call it, there's a place field over here. What happens if we change something about the room, change something about the environment? Let's take a look. Just as a reminder, neuron A fired at the very tip, neuron B fired somewhere over here. Now we've changed the environment, and now it needs to go to the left. Back to the right. Uh, these are the same neurons. They switch. No, I mean like yeah, because like A is going up more than B this time. Yeah, yeah. So now neuron A is firing a lot more in this location. And the location where it's firing is different now. We call this remapping. When you learn, your neurons are of course firing, and when you learn something new, when you take in new information, the connectivity and the way that the neurons are firing change. This is learning, or I should say plasticity, in the brain that lead you to learn new information. Um, when you, when you uh, put larger time gaps in between, like the remapping, have you noticed a change, like the activation of neurons? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So 
You do this today. Come back one week from now. If you leave everything the same, it'll fire the same way. And that's because you don't want your memory to be so plastic. Right? You need to be able to remember certain information. You don't want it to change all the time. And the other thing is, in younger people, our brains are very plastic. That's why we soak up all this new information. But in older folks, you can imagine their brains are not as plastic. And it's been shown in these studies that they remap less. In humans or in animals, the humans. Uh, I'm under the, the belief, or I think, in humans that regardless of age, you can still take on new information. But I'm not an aging expert, though. I would recommend maybe there's some folks that can use to focus on development. But it's not to say that you know, humans who are older can't learn anything, because that's just a myth. Of course they can. So this is really cool. And this is uh, an example of how you can use research to analyze brain cells and behavior together. Uh, I'm going to jump a bit further to this section. I talked about what, I talked about when, I talked about where, but I didn't talk about who. And your hippocampus is also important. This is a video I showed recently in one of my learning memory classes. Now raise your hand if you've seen this already. So this is his name's Clive Waring, and he had a virus go past his eye, reach parts of his brain, and destroy areas critical for memory formation. <laughs> is consigned to live entirely within the present with terrible consequences. Clive Waring has the worst case of amnesia ever known. 20 years ago, he lost his memory, and now his wife, Deborah, is the only person he recognizes. Totally inactive, day and night the same, no thoughts at all. 
Well, I'm concerned. The doctors have been totally incompetent. I've never seen a doctor the whole time. So that's that's a really beautiful story. Of Clyde Waring uh, and his wife. Uh, I think they're now divorced. There's a book out there about it. But I just find this fascinating because it combines memory, specifically social memory, to the part of the brain that is damaged, which is the amygdala. And throughout my graduate work, uh, I studied it a lot in the brain. This is just a depiction that often you'll see in your textbooks that there's there are connectivity throughout the brain. And it's not just the hippocampus working in isolation. There are many different parts of the brain that are interconnected. If you are interested in this topic, the QR code on that flyer is from this paper, which is one of my advisors, Dr. Cooper. And through graduate school, I uh, published the work using social interactions in rats. So these are two rats socially interacting with one another, and I was able to characterize how far they were from each other, if they were investigating each other's noses or tails, just social behavior in general. And while I was doing this work, I found the work of these folks here, my postdoctor advisors, Robert Liu, Ward Berman, Larry Young. Larry in particular is one of the leaders in the field of social behavior, specifically oxytocin. And he uses furry wolves as a model for social behavior. They're my favorite animal model. It used to be rats, but now it's furry wolves. They live out in the Midwest, out in the prairie. And what's really special about them is that when they were caught out in the wild, the uh, amount of times they were caught in pairs together with another is much higher than their cousins, the meadow wolves. Which means that these furry wolves like to hang out with the same partner across time. So we term this socially monogamous. And because these socially monogamous furry wolves are interested in one another, we can use this as an assay or a behavioral test. We can put the subject animal into the arena, tie their partner to one side, tie their stranger to the other side, and ask, who do you like to hang out with? Similarity would be, you head into this room with your partner, and there's this somebody else on the other side. Who are you going to go interact with? In these socially monogamous prairie bulls, they spend a large majority of their time with their partner. Yes? Do they ever interact with the stranger? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you'll see that the contact with their partner is so much higher than contact with the stranger. Whereas their cousins, the Montane wolves, you don't see this huge contact with their partner. Yes? Uh, rodents are mammals, and only 5% of mammals, including rodents, are socially monogamous. Most mammals are not socially monogamous. Humans are socially monogamous as well. You might be thinking, humans cheat. These guys cheat. So in some ways, this is uh, ecologically relevant. So looking at this, if you were to section, yeah. So the vulture side is female and white. Yeah, 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 exactly. This is male, this is female, this is female. You could also do the reverse and have this be female, this is male, this is male. Yes. Have there been studies where it's one male and one male and one female? No. Yeah, so, so the males will generally be aggressive and fight other males. But are there kind of differences in terms of time spent with partner or is it just 
Yeah, yeah, there are. So uh, the females generally will spend larger amounts of time with their male partner. The males also spend significantly more time with their partner, but not to the extent that the females do. And that brings up a really good point. Uh, I haven't put this study into my slides, but what do you think would happen if you give these animals alcohol? So here's the question. This is a female, this is a male, this is a female. If you give the male alcohol, where do you think they'll go? So you're saying you give this male alcohol, he'll talk to the stranger more? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So he's so Yeah. Yeah. It's been published. You give this male variable alcohol, it spends more time with the stranger. Or I should say, it spends no difference in time with the stranger versus partner. So here's the flip side of it. This is a male, this is a female, this is a male. You give the female alcohol, what do you think she'll do? The partner? Yeah. She spends more time with more people. Which is fascinating because this suggests that there's a difference in biology and sex, also in genetics, in the way that these animals are interacting with one another. And if you were to look into the brain, of the prairie bull, and this is their, again, their cousin, the montane bull, you'll see the part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, which is important for motivation, reward processing, has a huge dark, darker means high density of oxytocin receptors. Their cousin, the montane bull, don't have that high density, which is associated with how much they're spending time with the more oxytocin receptors you have in the nucleus accumbens, the more bonded you are to your partner. Montane bulls don't seem to be bonded. Yes? Yeah, for sure. So you can imagine there are some cases out in the world where if you're with a partner, you produce offspring, and uh, both parents will take care of the offspring together. Bird bulls are biparental. Mom and dad both take care of the offspring. In another strategy, it could be that the male will just have sex with whoever, and, and spread uh, their, yeah, further on. So there are these two competing strategies to it. The Montane bull seems to be using the one where you don't need to take care of your kids, you can just spread your seeds and move on. Whereas furry bulls are more similar to humans where both parents will take care of children together and they stay with each other. Yes, Chris? Yeah, I'm just wondering, so I could summer um, you found that Um, yeah, so the, in Larry Young's work, we've done early life stressors, which, is, which means, let's say as you're a child, you're really stressed out, and maybe only mom is taking care of you. It's been shown in these animals that when you grow up, you have less strong of a preference for your partner. And that's because if you're a baby and you only have mom taking care of you, only mom is looking, grooming you, you don't have that pro-social contact with both parents, which means it changes the distribution of oxytocin receptors in the brain. And due to differences in oxytocin receptors, the level of bonding later on is different. So is there a difference? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. 
Sorry, but we can follow up. Are the pair bondings in nature are they only between different sex, or do you also see platonic pair bondings and like same sex pair bondings? Yeah, for sure. Pair bonding and the nerve sense of love course next semester. It's not just romantic love. The same circuitry is critical for maternal bonding as well. So this could be mother and baby. When mom is uh, giving birth, oxytocin is being flooded. When mom is nursing their baby, oxytocin is also being flooded. This could be when I recently got a puppy. When I look into my puppy's eyes, <laughs> oxytocin is being released in both me and the puppy as well to facilitate this social bond and friendships. Great question. So moving further, we have this as an animal model. And what I'm doing with them is I'm implanting a wireless bonder to be able to record from single unit activity brain cells in their brain to ask the question, am I able to use brain activity to predict how strong their bond will be with their partner in the future. So this is ongoing work. This is what I'm currently doing. With that being said, uh, I do want to end on this slide over here. Because I've talked a bit about oxytocin. And it's a bit of a misnomer to be calling oxytocin the love hormone. Some of you might have heard oxytocin, love hormone, or cuddle hormone. That's a misnomer. Oxytocin is orchestrating the amount of salience that's going on in your brain. If you have a flood of oxytocin, that means your interaction, that event, is salient to you. There are autistic kids out there with their parents buying oxytocin off of the black market and injecting it intranasally to their kids. Up the nose. Thinking that oxytocin administration is just going to help them cope socially and bond with others in relationships. It's not the way that works. And the lab recently published a study to let um, parents really know and also medical professionals that oxytocin is not just this pro-social hormone. Because if you were to inject oxytocin and your kid goes off to school, onto the school bus, and gets bullied, you know what's gonna happen? That oxytocin increases the salience of that bullying event, which is not gonna help those social needs. Or let's say the parent injects oxytocin right before they go to sleep, it's a neutral event that's not gonna help those social needs. So are you saying that if you really get bullied, it will kind of convert it into Stockholm, or? I'm not sure about Stockholm, but the bullying event itself will be highly salient. What do you mean when you say salient? Salient means that the, the, um, the amount of detail of that event is really high. So think of it like, like this here. This is old school TV where you might get a lot of static. This is currently like the 80-ish. Salient means that the amount of specific details during that uh, event is high. So essentially, you're more likely to remember the experience, right? So yeah. you could have a negative effect. Right, so it could be a negative effect. So oxytocin currently is being used as a potential treatment in a controlled context where Given during structured play or during positive behavioral therapy, it's been shown to help autistic kids in their post social development. Yes. So, so you've done negative prior effects bad with positive prior effects with positive connotations. Yeah. yeah. And there are some published studies to suggest that. Yes. So, if someone wanted to alter their behavior to do something that they don't like, they can't play with their activities, to make something more favorable or Right. I I think I know what you're getting at. You're asking me if there's a drug that could be used to help with that? Yeah. yeah. 
So sometimes I'm asked by people, um, hey, I'm dating. Is there a drug that I can use to help me bond or help the other person bond with me better? And oxytocin, for some folks, are being used as a cologne. Put it on their body. <laughs> They go out to the date and they think, oh, um, that person is going to bond with me. And, and you all know more information now. What do you think will happen? It has to be, it has to be business connection. Right. And it, it does have to be business Right. All it's doing is increasing the salience. If anything, it'll make the person more confident in their interaction, but it's not going to necessarily help. But that's it. But it could help. Well, the experience is more salient. Potentially, but no one has done this study yet. Could be a potential future study. So, with that being said, um, oxytocin, social memories are what I do over at Urban University. If you want more information, come chat with me. And thank you so much for your time.